Thank you, choir. I can see little baby Jesus being lifted up. Amen. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Luke chapter 1, verses 47 through 55. During the uh, Advent readings for this time of year, uh, this is one of the passages they had recommended for this morning. So as I looked at that, it was about uh, Elizabeth and Mary and decided that we would uh, read that today and see how God worked in their lives. We're talking today about ordinary things. So as we look at uh, Luke chapter 1, let's uh, start back verse 39 rather than 47. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. His mercy extends to those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with His arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped His servant Israel remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. And Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Let's pray together. Fathers, we come to this passage. Uh, it's uh, Mary's song. It's called the Magnificat, and uh, it's uh, famous uh, for Mary's words of praise that are uttered because of the great things you did in her life. But Lord, let us recognize that her song of praise can be our song of praise. Because when we trust your word and act in faith, you do great things. Amen. And so, Lord, we pray that our ordinary things will become extraordinary in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. The birth of Jesus reminds us that God always does things that we do not expect. And uh, if we were planning it, we would uh, expect a Savior to be born in a palace, wouldn't we? Or to parents of wealth and fame. And yet, he was born in a stable to parents who had little recognition. We would expect an elaborate state function with parades and parties to announce the birth of of a king, and yet only the shepherds and a few wise men knew of the birth of the baby Jesus. And so that's what we want to look at this morning, is that God often uses the ordinary to bring about the extraordinary. He does things a little bit different than you and me. Amen. The good news is that God can use you and me in his kingdom work and in his eternal purposes that he has in store for each one of us. And he is looking for people of faith to do just that thing. Amen. Now let's look at this passage and see how God used uh, Mary and Elizabeth in particular to fulfill his purposes. First thing we want to look at is that God uses unlikely means to bring about his plan. He uses unlikely means to bring about his plan. Uh, God, in other words, uses methods that we wouldn't think of. He uh, does things that are out of the ordinary. He does things that, that uh, seem to be impossible for us. And yet he uses these ordinary things and makes something extraordinary out of them. 
And so let's look at these unlikely means that happen in this passage. I hope you noticed that. God used ordinary pregnancies to accomplish his divine goals. Pregnancy is a normal thing, right? It's an ordinary thing. There's many, many births going on right at this moment around the world. And, and we see that as a normal part of life. And yet God did something extraordinary with it. Notice that Elizabeth was old and Mary was a virgin when they became pregnant. Here's something extraordinary. That God would use Elizabeth, a lady that was beyond childbearing age, and that God would use a virgin, a woman who had never been married, to have children. Now, you remember the story of uh, Elizabeth and Zacharias and, and how Zacharias had gone in the temple and he was uh, offering, the sacri- offering the incense and uh, the angel appeared to him and said, you're going to have a, a son, you're going to call his name John, and Elizabeth's are going to bear uh, that son to you. And uh, it was a miracle because Zacharias thought, you know, just like Father Abraham before him, this could never happen. This is beyond the normal. And yet his wife Elizabeth did become pregnant. And when Mary comes to greet her, she's about six months along. Mm -hmm. And and Mary must have known about this. It must have gone and been reported through the family. And uh, so Mary, when she found out she was pregnant, went immediately to see Elizabeth. Here's someone she could have uh, by her side to comfort not only Elizabeth, but Elizabeth to comfort her. Because you remember, Mary was a virgin. She was betrothed, engaged to Joseph, but she had not yet been married to Joseph. And so as a result of that, for her to be pregnant would have been a scandal. And yet she goes and greets Elizabeth. And both of the ladies hug each other and say, wow, isn't God fantastic? Isn't he fantastic? Notice what it says in verses 39 through 40. At that time, Mary got ready hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. God was using these two women, using ordinary pregnancies to accomplish something that was extraordinary. A prophet would come from Elizabeth, and a savior would come from Mary. God would fulfill his plans in this universe. God God does extraordinary things at times, things that we're not expecting at all. Um, Many of you uh, who watch Fox News or uh, read uh, newspapers uh, have seen the uh, correspondent or reporter by the name of Kirsten Powers. And uh, Kirsten writes for the USA Today, and she's a reporter for the Daily Beast, and She's also on Fox News as, a, as usually a dem- Democrat consultant and giving the Democrat point of view, and if someone else gives the Republican point of view. And yet you may not know her story, what's happened to her. She grew up in Alaska. Her, her family were Episcopalians. They went to church, but it didn't mean much to them. Her father was an archaeologist, very intellectual man, and uh, she grew up in that kind of heady atmosphere. But faith never really meant anything to her family. So when she went to college and she did all the readings and she heard all the other people talking about this, you know, religion is just uh, a bunch of uh, baloney and you don't need to follow God. And, and she just decided that she was either atheist or agnostic. She really didn't care, but she wasn't a believer. And so she went on and graduated and, and she got the assignment after college to be a part of the Clinton administration during the 90s. And there she worked in Washington, D.C., among other intellectuals, among uh, politicians. And she said, if there were Christians there, I never knew them because no one ever told me they were Christians. And so she went on after that to go to New York City, and there she became a reporter. And uh, she wrote for some of the, uh, the newspapers there and did uh, television work and uh, ran around with a sophisticated crowd and elitist crowd that pretty much was pretty always secular, never attended church, never had anything to do with religion at all. As a matter of fact, uh, her idea was that um, anybody that was was Christian or anybody that was religious was pretty much nuts. 
crazy people. And uh, she met a man, and uh, she started dating this man. And a friend had asked her, well, you know, what are, what are the terms of your dating? She said, I don't care who the man is as long as he's not a religious nut. <laughs> and yet she started dating this fella who was a, a writer uh, at one of the major New York pa papers, and, and uh, he was a Christian, a man into Jesus. And she really liked the guy, but she just kind of ignored his religion side. She said, I'll, I'll date him as long as he doesn't ask me to go to church or something and talk about Jesus. But after they were dating several months and uh, well into their relationship, one day he set her down in uh, her West Village apartment and he said, do you believe in Jesus as your Savior? And she said, my stomach sank. I started to panic. Oh, no. My first thought was, he's crazy. <laughs> and then he said, do you think you could believe in him? And he explained that he was at a point in his life when he wanted to get married. He felt they had a good relationship, but he, he could not marry a person that didn't believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so then he said uh, a magic words for uh, someone who's liberal. Would you at least keep an open mind about it? And she said, oh, yeah, I could be open-minded. So he said, okay, come to church with me. <laughs> and she had to bite her words. And she goes, oh, no, what am I going to do? Well, she went to church, and it happened to be uh, the church that Tim Keller pastors, Redeemer Presbyterian in New York City. Tim Keller is a pastor who has written many books. We've studied some of them here during discipleship training uh, at times. A very intelligent man and uh, very uh, well-read and thoughtful, and, and he's able to explain, especially to those who are atheists, why they need to become believers. And so uh, she started to attend, attend church. She was clueless about Christianity, and uh, she uh, especially didn't know that pres some Presbyterians were evangelicals because she said, I don't like evangelicals. They're especially nuts. And uh, she went and she heard Keller preach, and she found that his sermons were intellectually rigorous. They included art and history and philosophy, and she became interested, so she would go back every Sunday night. And she said after a while, Sunday nights became the highlight of her week. And she started listening and thinking about these things. And she said, well, uh, I'm okay. I'll, I'll enjoy this, but uh, I'll never give my life to it. But each week, Keller made the case for Christianity. And the more he did so, the more her atheism and agnosticism seemed to fall by the wayside because she couldn't intellectually defend it anymore. And she began to think, well, well, maybe he's right, but it's not for me. And uh, she began to read the Bible. And the boyfriend she had kept saying, I'm praying for you that you'll become a believer, that God will reveal himself to you. And so one night in 2006, she went on a trip to Taiwan. And uh, while she was there, she woke up, and she was kind of in between, she says, a, a dream or a dream state, and she didn't know exactly what it was, but she said, Jesus came to me and said, here I am. She said, it felt so real. I didn't know what to make of it. I called my boyfriend, but before I had time to tell him about it, he told me he'd been praying the night before and felt we were supposed to break up, so we did. And honestly, while I was upset, I was more traumatized by Jesus visiting me. In her atheistic world, she didn't understand how this could be true, that there really is a spiritual dimension to life. And so she returned to New York City. She said, everywhere I went, even though I tried to put it out of my mind, it seemed like God was everywhere, all around me, and I couldn't get away from him. And so she said, finally, she went to the author, Eric Metaxas, who uh, she knew from her days there in New York City, and uh, he suggested that she go to a Bible study, and he said, you need to go to Pastor Keller's wife's Bible study. And, and so she said, oh, no, I don't know if that's good or not, but she decided to go, and so she went. And there she found a loving group of people that listened to her questions and cared for her. And after a while, she came to a point where she left that Bible study and said, it's true. I know it's true and I believe it. And I want to be a follower 
of Jesus Christ. At first, she said she tried to get away from that, but she had this new sense of joy and peace in her life Amen. that God had come into her life and changed it. And now she unashamedly claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Amen. You see how God, in the ordinary circumstances of her life, broke in? Here's a lady that had completely put out the spiritual dimension. Everything was about the intellect. Everything was about uh, this world. And yet somehow God broke through using people and his own personal revelation to her that he was there and he was real and she needed to follow him. And that's what God did with Elizabeth and Mary. He used ordinary means to do extraordinary things. God did the same thing in Kirsten Powers' life as well. So we need to do that, don't we? We need to look for God yes. to act in unexpected ways. Amen. We, we don't need to just be living the humdrum. Right. We need to be looking around for God to do the great and Amen. mighty in our presence. Amen. We need to see where he's at work in this world. Isn't that what Isaiah says? For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are my your ways my ways. God does things completely out of the ordinary at times. Amen. And yet he breaks into our ordinary world and does extraordinary things through us. So look for him. Look for him to act in unexpected ways. Well, secondly, we see from this passage that God chooses unlikely people to bring about his purposes. He chooses unlikely people. Now, we've already mentioned he used these women with their ordinary pregnancies to do his mighty work in this world. But the fact that he used women was very important because women uh, in that day were not of very high note. Mm -hmm. They weren't recognized. Right. They weren't powerful. They were seen more or less as, as a chattel or property uh, to be disposed of as uh, men wished. And yet God chose women Amen. to bring his child into the world bring a great prophet into the world. And, and today we still have this, this thing against women, don't we? Yes. We, we, have, we have churches that exclude women from serving. You say, well, no, the women do the cooking. <laughs> <laughs> women teach the kids. Yes. No, I'm talking about we exclude women from preaching and teaching and, and taking leadership roles in the church. Because somehow we think that's against the Bible. And, and yet, isn't it amazing that God uses women that's right. at the birth of Christ? Amen. And God uses women at the resurrection of Christ? Yes, Amen. The men are always catching up. Yes. God uses women. God chooses unlikely people to bring about his purposes. And here we find this wonderful thing that God chose to use ordinary women to advance his kingdom. Notice what it says there in verse 42 through 45. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. And here these two ladies are overjoyed. Elizabeth. Because she's going to have a son. But now, this relative of hers, Mary, is also going to have a child. And, and she's going to be the mother of the Lord. What an amazing thing. Amen. That God would use these two women to fulfill his purposes in this world. God always seems to choose unlikely people to fulfill his purposes. You know, there, if you go on in, in the book of Luke, <clears throat> you read that... Um, there's a lot of movers and shakers that are mentioned, uh, especially as you go up uh, through uh, chapter 3 of Luke. It mentions seven prominent leaders of that day and age in which Jesus was born. It talks about the Roman emperor Tiberius Caesar. It talks about Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea. It talks about Herod and Philip and Lysanias, who were leaders of the regional level. <coughs> it talks about Annas and Caiaphas who served as high priests and they took their religious authority seriously. 
All those were shakers and movers. They were the powerful. They were the politicians. They, they were the ones that led the military. They were the ones that controlled the government and, and the purse strings. And yet, what did God do? God decided to use a carpenter. God decided to use a young girl. God decided to use a country priest. God used shepherds. An older woman. He did all this to do his work. And God can use you too. He uses ordinary people like you and me to do and accomplish what he wants done. You see, God uses the humble people the world thinks are useless and unimportant to bring about great things. Amen. And he's always been doing that down through the ages. It seems to be his way. Paul writes about this. He said in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 27, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Amen. Paul's saying this seems to be God's methodology to do something completely unexpected. Amen. To use people no one else would ever choose to accomplish his goals and his purposes. You say, well, Pastor, that sounds very good, you know, and, and and it sounds all biblical and all, but I don't see how that relates to us in this world, in my day. Well, let me tell you, God used you this weekend. All your preparations for the Bethlehem men, all your practices, all, all the work going into preparing the food, getting the decorations done. You know, with so many hands involved in, in that, and, and so many comments were made on the way out. Yes. Uh, Edwin and I were there greeting people as they left and, and saying thank you for coming. And we, we'd hear comments yes. from these people about things that were accomplished. Yes. You, ordinary Parkview members, did something great. Amen. God used you yes. in a mighty way. Amen. Congratulate yourself. I had one lady come up to me and she says, I wish you all were down in Ocala Amen. because you're the friendliest group of people I've ever met. Amen. That's, right. That's you. Yeah. Ordinary people that God used Amen. in extraordinary ways. Amen. I don't know about you, but I've been working for months trying to get my neighbors to come to church and they were there last night. Yes. Amen. I've been working for two years to get another fellow to come to church to one of our events and he was there last night. Amen. And I know some of you had many come that had never come to anything before. That's right. Others came up to us and said, this is really fantastic. I'm going to come back next year. Yes. Yes. I even had my hairdresser come. Yes. Okay? Yes. And God used you to touch those people's lives. Yes. Now, I won't say names or who this person was, but one person came up and said, what you said, I've been thinking about it, and I've never heard it quite put that way before. Yes. Especially that story you told about Duck Dynasty and, and the Robertsons. Amen. And, and she says, I, I'm a religious person, but I, I've never heard it put that way before. I said, well, I'd be glad to talk with you about that. She goes, oh, I'm, I'm already a religious person, but I never heard it put that, put, heard it put that way before. I, I, I don't quite understand and yet God was speaking to her heart. Amen. You see, you were part of that. Amen. You impacted people. Yes. And I want you to understand, Parkview, all those practices, all that time, all that energy, yes. all that effort, it was worth it. Amen. Because God used you. Amen. And God is touching people's lives because of you. Amen. You see, that's, that's the wonderful thing as we look at this passage, is that God uses unlikely people to accomplish his purposes. And he can use you and me to do great things in this world. 
And let me just close with this. God uses ordinary faith to bring about extraordinary promises. He uses ordinary faith to bring about extraordinary promises. <clears throat> when we look at Mary's song, one of the first things we find out there is that she's praising God at how he used her, just a humble person of faith, a nobody, she says, that God would use her to fulfill his purposes. Mary recognizes that the Lord is fulfilling all his promises to Israel through her simple act of faith. And as she thinks about that and marvels over it, she, she is just overwhelmed that God would use me to do something great, to fulfill his promises and his prophecies. Mary says this, and Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. God was fulfilling promises through her, and she was overwhelmed with gratitude. And God wants to fulfill his promises through you and me as well. <clears throat> We've all heard of uh, William Carey, especially if you're a Baptist and you learned about missions. But, but he was just an ordinary man that had extraordinary faith. He, he was from a working class family there in the 18th century. He was a carpenter, a shoemaker rather. And while he was crafting shoes, Carey would read theology and and he would look at journals of explorers, and he began to think about God's word and stories about uh, sharing the good news with others. And God laid it on his heart that he should go as a missionary overseas, untrained, yes, but God was calling him to go, just a normal shoemaker. And so he went to India as a missionary, and he did the work of evangelist, but he also learned <clears throat> Indian dialects. And he translated the word of God into those dialects. And, and for a long time, that was one of the few translations the people of India had to use for the word of God. And Carrie's passion for missions is expressed in this phrase. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. Amen. And he lived that out in his life. And thousands of other people, hearing that same maxim that he used, have been touched to go and give their lives to missions Amen. as well. You see, what was the key to that? Not that he was someone great, but that he had a great God. The key to it was that, that he was small, but in simple faith, he could believe a God who was bigger than he was, Amen. and God would accomplish things through him. Amen. And that's what Mary was rejoicing about, that she, a humble servant of God, is being used to accomplish great purposes in this world. And God wants to do that through you and me as well. Amen. Now Mary's song shows the greatness of God's mercy and the severity of his judgment. And, and we want to think about what she's talking about here, that God honors the humble. It may not seem like it in this world, but he does honor the humble. Notice what it says in verses 50 through 53. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he's performed mighty deeds with his arm. He's scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. Mary says only God could do something like that. And then Mary's song rejoices in the God who keeps his covenant with Abraham and protects his faithful people Israel. Here she goes back to that wonderful promise God made to Father Abraham, that all the nations of the world will be blessed through him. Did God fulfill that promise? Mary says yes. Notice what she says in verses 54 and 55. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Yes. The prophecies were fulfilled. Jesus was to be born, the Savior of the world, the one who would bless all nations of the world. 
but put their faith and trust in him. Mary could see how God fulfilled his promises and his prophecies. You see, God is always faithful to his word. He's looking for people of faith to believe his promises and do his will. And that's exactly what Mary did. She believed God, and God worked. Are you a person of faith? Notice what it says there in Luke 1, 35 to 38. The angel answered to Mary, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. The angel said, you're going to have a baby. He's going to be great. He's going to be the Savior. Mary said, how can that be? God's going to do it, the angel said. And so there in that moment, Mary had a choice. Was she going to believe God's word? Or was she going to reject it? Was she going to accept her role by faith that God would use her? Or was she going to say, no, God, it's too big, it's too impossible? No, Mary said, I'll accept it. I trust you. I'll believe the word that God has given to you. And as she did that, in that moment, God fulfilled his promises to you and to me to send a Savior to this world. Now let me ask you, are you willing to let God use your ordinary life to do extraordinary things? Can you, can you dream a little bit about how God could use you? You know, the more you obey him and follow his word, the more he's willing to use you and the more he's going to accomplish. But it starts with little steps. Many of you have been doing that through the Bethlehem minute, these little steps. And people's lives have been touched. And God used you. What more does he have in store for you? Are you willing to believe him and follow him and do his will? He's calling us. Will you step out in faith and believe? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to you this morning, our prayer is that each one of us will have a revelation of you, a vision of you. Yes. Just like you spoke to Kirsten Powers and changed her life. Lord, speak to us and call us from the ordinary to do the extraordinary. Just like you spoke to Mary and she believed. Give us that type of faith to trust your word and believe. doesn't matter if we're a shoemaker like William Carey or a carpenter like Joseph or a shepherd in the fields. doesn't matter if we're someone that works down at the local retail store or works in a body shop or teaches school or does anything else in this life. Lord, when you call us, give us grace to say, yes, Lord. Your servant hears, and I will do it according to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be here this morning. You may not have ever received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's the reason for the season. So we give you that opportunity to say, yes, I want to follow Jesus. I want Jesus to come into my life. I want him to be my Savior. So our invitation to you is to come, receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. But for others, it may be that God is speaking to your heart. He's touching you in some way. And you need to say, yes, Lord, I'll follow you. And you come, share that with us. And we'll pray with you about what God's called you to do. You come as we sing together.